Alright scholars, so today I'm going to be reading to you the chapter Throwing the Hammer. So before I begin reading, I want to give a shout out to Trinity, Nevea, and Eker for answering last week's questions with exemplar answers. Alright, so for any scholars that did um, maybe were unclear about some of the questions from last week, I'm going to go ahead and read you their answers so we can clarify what chapter we left off on and so that we can move on to this chapter. All right, so the first question was, why does Miss Honey go over to the Wormwoods? So Trinity, um, oh, and the second part was, why was she so surprised? All right, so Trinity answered that Miss Honey tells them, tells the Wormwoods that Matilda is a very hard worker at school. She's brilliant, she's smart for a five-year-old, she's doing all kinds of things five-year-olds typically shouldn't be doing. And the Wormwoods, simply don't care, right? They just say, oh well, we want to keep watching the telly, right? The television. So that's why Miss Honey was so surprised. Um, the other part of this of this question, why Miss Honey goes over to the Wormwoods, Eker answered, great, Eker answered um, that Miss Honey goes to offer private tuition for Matilda. So as I said before, private tuition is basically like tutoring, like some students stay after school to get some extra help um, on any of their classes, something that maybe they didn't understand during the day. So Matilda is going to get offered tutoring from Miss Honey because Miss Honey just wants to teach her as many things as she can, right? She knows that school is too easy for her, right? So Miss Honey goes to um, offer Matilda private tuition. And for the big idea, Nevea answered that Miss Honey goes to have a conversation about Matilda but her parents are mean because they don't care. So I like that, right? It's short and sweet. Miss Honey goes to the Wormwood's house to have a conversation about how smart Matilda is, um, to offer her private tuition. But basically her parents, as we know, not the nicest parents, not the best parents, they really don't care about her education. And Miss Honey just can't believe how intelligent this girl came to be without her parents, right? And we read from the beginning of the chapter, if you remember, Matilda self-taught herself. She walked over to the library every day and just read and read books. So that just shows scholars how much reading can actually help your brain. You can read about anything and learn about anything and then your brain will go. All right, scholars, so today we are going to read seven pages. There are a lot of pictures and dialogue. So this video is going to be cut into two parts, all right? There's going to be a halfway mark in this video where you can pause and then come back to it later on in the day, the next day, whatever you want. Um, and that's because this chapter is pretty long. There's a lot of dialogue, a lot of pictures. Um, so that's going to be up to you. The second thing I want to remind you today is that there are a lot of words that might seem unfamiliar to you, and they're not unfamiliar, you might not know them because they're just hard words, that is because this author, the person who wrote this book, is from England. So England is a country far away from here in a part of Europe, all right? It's part of Northern Europe. So they talk a little differently, they say some words differently, um, and you know, you might think they sound silly because the author also writes in a silly manner. So if you just come across words, and this chapter is a lot of different words, um, that you might not know, I'm going to remind you to just use your context clues and try to piece together what that word might mean. Okay, so your buzzwords for today are inclined, amiably, and skullduggery. So skullduggery is an English word. It's one of those words that comes from England, so that's why you might not hear it in everyday language, but I just want to let you guys know what it means. Throwing the hammer. The nice thing about Matilda was that if you had met her casually and talked to her, you would have thought she was a perfectly normal five and a half year old child. She displayed almost no outward sign of her brilliance and she never showed off. This is a very sensible and quiet little girl you would have said to yourself. And unless for some reason you had started a discussion with her about literature or mathematics, you would have never known the extent of her brain power. It was therefore easy for Matilda to make friends with other children. All those in her class liked her. They knew, of course, that she was clever because she had because they had heard her being questioned by Miss Honey on the first day of the term. And they also 
and they knew also that she was allowed to sit quietly with a book during lessons and not pay attention to the teacher. But children of their age do not search deeply for reasons. They are far too wrapped up in their own small struggles to worry over much about what others are doing and why. Among Matilda's newfound friends was a girl called Lavender. Right from the first day of the term, the two of them started wandering around together during the morning break and in the lunch hour. Lavender was exceptionally small for her age, a skinny little nymph with deep brown eyes and with dark hair that was cut in a fringe across her forehead. Matilda liked her because she was gusty and adventurous. She liked Matilda for exactly the same reasons. Before the first week of term was up, awesome tales about the headmistress, Miss Trunchbull, began to filter through to the newcomers. Matilda and Lavender, standing in a corner of the playground during morning break on the third day, were approached by a rugged 10-year-old with a boil on her nose called Hortensia. New scum, I suppose, Hortensia said to them, looking down from her great heights. She was eating from an extra large bag of potato chips and digging the stuff out in handfuls. Welcome to the borstal, she added, spraying bits of crisp out of her, out of her mouth like snowflakes. So crisp is just a word for chips that they use. The two tiny ones, confronted by this giant, kept a watchful silence. Have you met the trunch boy yet, Hortensia asked. We've seen her at prayers, Lavender said, but we haven't met her. You've got a treat coming to you, Hortensia said. She hates very small children. She therefore loathes the bottom class and everyone in it. She thinks five-year-olds are grubs that haven't yet hatched out. In went another fistful of crisps, and when she spoke again, out spread the crumbs. If you survive your first year, you may just manage to live the rest of your time here. But many don't survive. They often get out. They often get carried out on stretchers screaming. I've seen it often. Hortensia paused to observe the effect these remarks as you can see right here, the picture of Hortensia, the two little five-year-olds, and the big 10 year old eating her crisps were having on the two titchy ones. Not very much. They seem pretty cool. So the large one decided to regale them with further information. I suppose you know the Trunchbull has a lockup cupboard in her private quarters called the Chokey. Have you heard about the Chokey? Matilda and Lavender shook their heads and continues to gaze up at the giant. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. Okay, scholars, so that was your first buzzword for today, inclined. So I'm going to read that sentence again. Being very small, they were inclined to mistrust any creature that was larger than they were, especially senior girls. So inclined just means you're, you feel willing to do something. Okay, so these um, girls, Matilda and Lavender, are five. They're really, really little, right? Remember the picture up here? And because Hortensia is so much bigger, she scares them, right? So they don't feel like they can trust her right away. They're kind of scared, so they're not really trusting everything Hortensia is saying. They just think that maybe she's just messing with them to make them scared. Okay, let's keep going. The choky Hortensia went on is a very tall but very narrow cupboard. The floor is only 10 inches square, so you can't sit down or squat in it. You have to stand, and three of the walls are made of cement with bits of broken glass sticking out all over, so you can't lean against them. You have to stand more or less at attention all of the time when you get locked up in there. It's terrible. Can she lean against the door, Matilda asked. Don't be daft, Hortensia said. The door's got thousands of sharp, spiky nails sticking out of it. Ouch. They've been hammered through from the outside, probably by the trench for herself. Have you ever been in there, Lavender asked. My first term, I was there six times, Hortensia said. Twice for a whole day, and the other times for two hours each. But two hours is quite bad enough. It's pitch dark and you have to stand up dead straight. And if you wobble at all, you get spiked either by the glass or the walls, uh, either by the glass on the walls or the nails on the door. Ooh, that sounds mean. 
Why were you put in, Matilda asked. What had you done? The first time, Hortensia said, I poured myself half a tin of golden syrup on the seat of the chair the trunchful was going to sit on at prayers. It was wonderful. When she lowered herself into the chair, there was a loud squelching noise similar to that made by a hippopotamus when lowering its foot into the mud on the banks of the Limpopo River. But you're too small and stupid to have read the just so stories, aren't you? I've read them, Matilda said. This is Orthentia telling them the great story with theatrics. You're a liar, Orthentia said amiably. You can't even read yet, but no matter. All right, Scott, so that was your second buzzword, amiably. So amiably just kind of means in a friendly manner. So Orthentia said, you're a liar. Um, but she didn't say it in a very mean way. She said it in a pleasant, friendly manner. So that's why she said, no matter, and kept going on with the story. Because we know that Matilda actually did read the stories, right? Because we know she reads such um, a great amount of adult books that aren't really for her age. So we know that Matilda was telling the truth. And from the way that Hortensia said it amiably, we can also tell that Hortensia is just a friendly girl trying to tell them stories. I'm going to continue now. You can't even read yet, but no matter. So when the trench bowl sat down on the golden syrup, the squelch was beautiful. And when she jumped up again, the chair sort of stuck to the seat of those awful green breeches that she wears. Breeches, by the way, was a past buzz buzzword, which I hope some of you remember. They're like these pants that she wears that only go down to the knee. Um, she wears and came up with with her for a few seconds until the thick syrup slowly became unstuck. Then she clasped her hands to the seat of her breeches and both hands got covered in the muck. You should have heard her bellow. But how did she know it was you, Lavender asked. A little squirt called Oli Bog Whistle sneaked out on me, Orthensia said. I knocked his front teeth out. Oh. And the trench bowl put you in the chokey for a whole day, Matilda asked, gulping. All day long, Orthensia said. I was off my rocker when she let me out. I was babbling like an idiot. All right, scholars, your question now is, what do we learn about the trench bowl from Orthensia? So Orthensia is a big 10-year-old girl telling Lavender and Matilda these stories about the trench bowl. What have we learned about the trench bowl from Orthensia? Okay, go ahead and answer that and then come back when you're ready. Oh, I can't remember them all now, Orthensia said. She spoke with the air of an old warrior who had been in so many battles that bravery has become commonplace. It's all so long ago, she added, stuffing more crisps into her mouth. Ah, yes, I can remember one. Here's what happened. I chose a time when I knew the trench bowl was out of the way, teaching the six formers, and I put up my hand and I asked to go to the box. But instead of going there, I sneaked to the trench bowl's room. And after a speedy search, I found the drawer where she kept all her gym knickers. So knickers are like shorts. Go on, Matilda said, spellbound. What happened next? Uh oh, we can see what might be happening. I had sent away by post, you see, for this very powerful itching powder, Dentia said. It cost 50 pence a packet and was called the skin scorcher. The label said it was made from powdered teeth of deadly snakes and it was guaranteed to raise welts the size of walnuts on your skin. So, I sprinkled this stuff inside every pair of knickers in the drawer and then folded them all up again carefully. Orthensia paused to cram more crisps into her mouth. Did it work, Lavender asked. Well, Orthensia said, a few days later, during prayers, the trench bowl suddenly started scratching herself like mad down below. Aha, I said to myself, here we go, she's changed for Jim already. It was pretty wonderful to be sitting there watching it all and knowing that I was the only person in the whole school who realized exactly what was going on inside the trench bowl's pants. And I felt safe, too. I knew I couldn't be caught. Then the scratching got worse. She couldn't stop. She must have thought she had a wasp nest, wasp's nest down there. And then right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, she leapt up and grabbed her bottom and rushed out of the room. Both Matilda and Lavender were enthralled. It was quite clear to them that they were at this moment 
standing in the presence of a master. Here was somebody who had brought the art of skullduggery to the highest point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who was willing to risk life and limb in pursuit of her calling. So I hope some of you buzz as your last buzzword for today, skullduggery. And I'm going to read that sentence one more time so you can think about what it might mean before I explain it. Here was somebody who had brought the art of skullduggery to the highest point of perfection. Somebody, moreover, who was willing to risk life and limb in pursuit of her calling. So here are Matilda and Lavender just looking at Hortensia and all, right? They're like, wow, this person has tricked and, and done a bunch of things to Miss Trunchbull. And yes, she's still alive telling us all these stories in front of us. So skullduggery just kind of means doing tricks, right? So it's just pulling pranks, doing tricks, messing with somebody. So here are Matilda and Lavender um, in front of this person who has mastered the art of skullduggery. They gazed in wonder at this goddess and suddenly even the boil on her nose was no longer a blemish but a badge of courage. The second question for today, scholars, how do Matilda and Lavender react to Hortensia's stories? How do they feel about the stories that Hortensia is telling them about the Trunchbull? The second part of that question is, why would they say that the boil on her nose was no longer a blemish, it was no longer like something bothersome, but it was a badge of courage? Why would they say that? And by the way, courage means being brave, being really brave. So why would they think it, it shows, it, it looks like a bag of courage? But how did she catch you that time, Lavender asked, breathless with wonder. She didn't, Hortensia said, but I got a day in the chokey just the same. Why, they both asked. The trunch board, Hortensia said, has a nasty habit of guessing. When she doesn't know who the culprit is, she makes a guess at it. And the trouble is, she's often right. I was a prime suspect this time because of the gold sir golden syrup job. And although I knew she didn't have any proof, nothing I said had made any difference. I kept shouting, how could I have done it, Miss Trunchbull? I didn't even know you kept any spare knickers at school. I don't even know, I don't even know what itching powder is. I've never even heard of it. But the lying didn't help me in spite of the great performance I put on. The Trunchbull simply grabbed me by one ear and rushed me to the chokey. Um, at the double and threw me inside and locked the door. That was my second all day stretch. It was absolute torture. I was spiked and cut all over when I came out. It's like a war, Matilda said, overawed. You're darn right, it's like a war, Thensia cried. And the casualties are terrific. We are the Crusaders, the gallant army, fighting for our lives with hardly any weapons at all. And the Trunchbull is the Prince of Darkness the foul serpent, the fiery dragon with all the weapons at her command. It's a tough life. We all try to support each other. You can rely on us, Lavender said, making her height of three feet, two inches stretch as tall as possible. No, I can't, Hortensia said. You're only shrimps, but you never know. We may find a use for you one day in some undercover job. Tell us a little bit more about what she does, Matilda said. Please do. I mustn't frighten you before you've been here a week, Hortensia said. You won't, Lavender said. We may be small, but we're quite tough. Listen to this then, Hortensia said. Only yesterday, the Trunchbull caught a boy called Julius Rotwinkle eating licorice all sorts during the scripture lesson, and she simply picked him up by one arm and flung him clear out of the open classroom window. Our classroom is one floor up, and we saw Julius Rotwinkle go sailing out over the garden like a frisbee and landing with a thump in the middle of the lettuces. Then the Trunchbull looked at us and said, from now on, any, anybody caught eating in class goes straight out the window. Did this Julius Rotwinkle break any bones? Lavender asked. Only a few, Orthensia said. You've got to remember that the Trunchbull once threw a hammer for Britain in the Olympics, so she's very proud of her right arm. All right, scholars, your next question for today is what do we learn about the Trunchbull and her strength? Okay, and I'd advise you to go back to this section 
this page where Hortensia starts telling them, telling them the new story about what the Trunchbull did. Okay, so what do we learn about the Trunchbull and her strength? What's throwing the hammer, Lavender asked. The hammer, Hortensia said, is actually a really great cannonball on the end of a long bit of wire. And the thrower whisks it around and round his or her head faster and faster, and then lets it go. You have to be terrifically strong. The Trunchbull will throw anything around just to keep her right arm in, especially children. Good heavens, Lavender said. I once heard her say, Hortensia went on, that a large boy is about the same weight as an Olympic hammer, and therefore he's very useful for practicing with. At that point, something strange happened. All right, scholars, so this is the end of your um, part one for today for this chapter. Since this chapter, like I said, is a little long, there's lots of stories and pictures, you can go ahead and pause here. Make sure you answer the questions, you have the big idea, and you tune in for the second part of this video whenever you're ready. Okay? Alright scholars, we're back with the second part of Throwing the Hammer chapter. So we left off on Hortensia telling Lavender and Matilda stories about the trench bullet and things she has done at the school to the children. So we left off on this very suspenseful, clip, suspenseful cliffhanger, which said, at that point, something strange happened. The playground, which up to them had been filled with, uh-oh, we see a picture right here. What do you think is going to go on? So which up to then had been filled with shrieks and the shouting of children at play all at once became silent as the grave. Watch out, Hortensia whispered. Oh, watch out, Hortensia whispered. Matilda and Lavender glanced around and saw the gigantic figure of Miss Trunchbull advancing through the crowd of boys and girls, which, which with menacing strides. The children drew back hastily to let her through, and her progress across the asphalt was like that of Moses going through the Red Sea when the waters parted. A formidable figure she was too, in her belted smock and green breeches. Below the knees, her calf muscles stood out like grapefruits inside her stockings. Amanda Thrip, she was shouting. You, Amanda Thrip, come here. Hold your hat, Hortensia whispered. What's going to happen, Lavender whispered back. That idiot, Amanda Hortensia said, has let her hair, her long hair, grow even longer during the holes, and her mother has plaited it into pigtails. Silly thing to do. Why silly, Matilda asked. If there's one thing the Trunchbull can't stand, it's pigtails, Hortensia said. Matilda and Lavender saw the giant in green breeches advancing upon a girl of about ten who had a pair of plated golden pigtails hanging over her shoulders. Each pigtail had a blue satin bow at the end of it, and it all looked very pretty. The girl wearing the pigtails, Amanda Thrip, stood quite still, watching the advancing giant, and the expression on her face was one that you might find on the face of a person who was certain that the day of judgment had come for her at last. Miss Trunchbull had now reached the victim and stood towering over her. I want those filthy pigtails off before you come back to school tomorrow, she barked. Chop them off and throw them in the dustbin, you understand? Amanda, paralyzed with fright, managed to stutter. My mummy likes them. She plates them for me every morning. Your mummy's a twit, the trunchbull bellowed. She pointed a finger the size of a salami at the child's head and shouted, You look like a rat with the tail coming out of its head. Oh my goodness. My mummy thinks I look lovely, Miss Tr Trunchbull, Amanda stuttered, shaking like a blank midge. I don't give a tinker's to what your mother thinks, what your mummy thinks, the Trunchbull yelled. And with that, she lunged forward and grabbed hold of Amanda's pigtails in her right fist and lifted the girl clear off the ground. 
Then she started swinging her round and round her head, faster and faster and faster, and Amanda was screaming, blue murder, and the trunch bull was yelling, I'll give you pigtails, you little rat. Shades of the Olympics, Hortensia murmured. She's getting up speed now like she does with the hammer. Ten to one, she's going to throw her. And now the trunch bull was leaning back against the weight of the whirling girl and pivoting expertly on her toes, spinning round and round as soon Amanda and soon Amanda Thrip was traveling so fast she became a blur. And suddenly, with a mighty grunt, the trunch bull let go of the pigtails, and Amanda went sailing like a rocket right over the wire of the playground and high up into the sky. So this is the image of Amanda Thrupp and the trunch bull uh, spinning her around and eventually throwing her over the wire of the fence wire of the school. Oh my goodness, poor girl. Look at all of these scholars just staring at her in fright. Well thrown, sir, someone shouted from across the playground. And Matilda, who was mesmerized by the whole crazy affair, saw Amanda Thrip descending in a long, graceful parabola onto the playing field beyond. She landed on the grass and bounced three times and finally came to a rest. Then, amazingly, she sat up. She looked a little, a little trifle dazed, and who could blame her? But after a minute or so, she was on her feet again and tottered back towards the playground. The trunch bull stood in the playground, dusting off her hands. Not bad, she said, considering I'm not in strict training. Not bad at all. Then she strode away. She's mad, Hortensia said. But don't the parents complain, Matilda asked. Would yours, Hortensia asked. I know mine wouldn't. She treats the mothers and fathers just the same as the children, and they're all scared to death of her. I'll be seeing you sometime, you two. And with that, she sauntered away. So this is the little girl, Amanda Thrupp, that was thrown by her two pigtails. Okay, and she sat up, kind of dazed, but she's fine. Okay, scholars, so the next chapter we have is called Bruce, Bog Trotter, and the Cake. These silly words are just entertaining all the time. Okay, so I hope that you fill out the one Google form. I have one instead of two this time. Hopefully that makes your life a little easier and um, you get to answer all three questions I have. Make sure to, this is a little challenge, to answer them in complete sentences, right? So we're restating the question that's asked. For example, if I ask, how does Miss Trunchbull feel about children with pigtails? Restating it means re-answering the question with kind of repeating the, what's part of the question. So for example, Miss Trunchbull feels blank, 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 about students with pigtails. So you're kind of repeating the question in your answer. I hope that makes sense. All right, scholars, so I'm glad that I got to read to y'all again. I hope that you're enjoying the little clips at the end. They're little bonuses because you guys are working so hard and I feel like you deserve to watch the movie. I'm gonna try to work on getting the movie available for you all so you could read um, the rest of the book on your own because we might not have time and then watch the book watch the movie on your own all right scholars stay safe i love you all and i really hope to see you soon bye guys